How are you now broadcasting from the studios of Milson's Point in Camaragal country? It is the Theory of Thing Investment Podcast Season 8, Episode 9. Remember, if it's talked about enough, it's a thing. This show is brought to you by the Australian Mutual Funds Exchange, Amfex.com. Go and check them out if you want to know about any sort of mutual funds or managed funds or whatever anywhere around the world. They've got a, the, the website is incredible to compare what they need to compare. Anyway, that's all fine. Go and check it out, amfex.com. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. A reminder that all the advice contained is general in nature only in this podcast. Speak to an advisor about your needs. That is what I do. I am James Whelan, investment manager at VFS Group. I'm a white male, aged 42. Uh, I'm wearing a blue polo shirt. I'm also sitting in a, you know, like a, a studio with one door, no windows, and a, and a poster of Conor McGregor, which is sort of lying on the floor. If people want a visual, that's what your visual is going to be. I'm joined by Heath Moss of HLM Investments. Uh, Heath, how are you now? Good afternoon. I'm very well, thanks, mate. Hope you're well. I'm um, fantastic. I am uh, I'm stoked for this weekend that's coming. Uh, also, it is the 9th of June. Oh, my God, it's already the 9th of June. Uh, I've just realised a whole heap of stuff that I forgot to do this week. It's Friday afternoon, the 9th of June, 2023. It's 3.08 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we're Well, today we're going to be talking about artificial intelligence, a really deep deep, deep cleanse on artificial intelligence. We're going to talk about the RBA, what a, whatever happened there, the Russell 2000 uh, footy tips that we've got, and also I have got nationals this weekend. Um, I've been training for the last six weeks straight um, in rope skipping, sorry, in rope jump, and... Uh, I'm a bit of a speed skipper now at the moment, and that's I've got I've got the competition this weekend. I mean, my kid, my kid's a national champion three times over. Um, people just expect that I'm going to be good at it. It doesn't work the opposite direction, guys. No, it doesn't <laughs> work upwards. There's, only there's, down. <laughs> there's no there's no inherent upward sort of uh, way that it goes. There's just me and a very embarrassed little girl who doesn't. I don't think she wants her dad to do it. I'm, I'm heartbroken. But anyway, so I've, I'm already pushed into it. I'm one of the athletes that's in this competition. Tomorrow I've got to jump. Um, it's a three-minute speed exercise. It's going to be phenomenal. Um, skipping, well, you know, speed skipping for three minutes straight. It's exhausting. It, it burns you right up. That's what I've got first thing in the morning, and then the rest of the time I'm going to be judging and doing what I need to do. What do you think of that? Fantastic. You're going to be sore, sore boy tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Anyway, look, I've been training for it. It's, it's more just a proof that you can start something. And just from nothing, I'm calling it that it's the novice to national sort of the, the way I can just go with the work and and the training regime that I've put and also the assessment of what I do and how I'm doing it, um, I can actually go from sort of zero to being competitive at this stage. Um, so it's in the plus 40s uh, group. I've, I've become one of those guys. And anyway, so that's what I'm doing. And look, we'll see how we go tomorrow, but it's just going to be more about that, that a determined mind with the right strategy can actually perform what it needs to perform i'm and sure you'll do well i'm sure and there's going to the be best there's going to be a great linkedin post out of this one too you just know that it's going to be one of those <laughs> one of those wanky linkedin posts that's going to come up and just go this is what and, can happen if you determine and dream and with the right training and strategy and you know, anyway all that crap and is, is it over. judged is are there winners and losers or there's, is it, there's no there's there's gold silver medals gold silver oh, bronze medals. Oh, god god forbid if you win i oh, know god help us all yeah, I, I, we, we don't we don't gloat because I, I teach I teach my little girl not to gloat, and you just take you take your medal and and that's and that's how you go. We don't, it's it's not that sort of competition. It's really yeah. sort of a friendly thing. But uh, the chance to to chance to be at Worlds is actually on up for up for grabs. So that's Japan in two years' time. So if, I mean, hopefully she makes it, and we just get to tag along, which would be great to go to Japan. Um, mate, the RBA. Well, actually, actually, no. You know what? Let's just get into it. We're we'll getting to the RBA later. Get, I want to try to keep going. Yeah, let's get going. So um, special guest today. Thanks for sitting quiet. You didn't really have to. You could have chipped in any time you want. Good mate of mine, good mate of the shows as well, uh, former sponsor from Global X ETFs, the head of investment strategy, Blair Hannon. How are you now, Blair? I don't know how I can compare to the ramblings of James Whelan just now for three minutes on skipping. Um, <laughs> you can't. People, have, people are still around. <laughs> I'm very impressed. It's. I was. I was given advice. You actually, what it was. I was actually given advice by someone because it was like, okay, how do we refresh the show? How do we? How do we go from the old format that we had to something new? And, and he just said, okay, so do you just start the show and then just start talking about shop? And I was like, yeah, pretty much. He's just like, that's everyone does that. That's boring. Try and talk a bit more about, you know, stuff that you're actually doing, stuff that stuff that you're trying to, you know, life, live, living, because that's it's, there's more to it than just us sitting here talking about 
artificial intelligence there's actually there's a whole world that's going on out there that people sort of want to know bits and pieces about what it is yeah, a, a true behind the curtain look of of james whelan and what's happening which is look interestingly is interesting because no one else is skipping i'm assuming i reckon you, if you're up against one other person i'll be blown away so there's five there's five plus 40s that are in this and i have no idea what i'm up against oh, i have oh there's, so there's a really good chance of you getting a medal <laughs> <laughs> there's a chance we, there's, there is there is a chance we get in the middle there, statistic boy. Oh, Thanks very much. Three fifths, which is pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Um, so look, that there's that there's something up for grabs, but we'll see how we go. Look, okay, then both of you can shut up. Uh, Blair, except for you, please don't shut up. Um, now you've got a really cool note here about artificial intelligence. Now, I asked you to come on board and talk about some stuff, which was great, and thank you for for being here as well. I hope that you're well. It's been a long time since we talked. Actually, the last time we caught up was at the gold, uh, the gold ETF. Uh, twenty year twenty year event, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, that was actually a really good event. That um, was a great event. For the context, yeah. that is the gold ETF, the first gold ETF ever listed globally. Ticked over twenty years this year, so um, yeah, we're pretty proud of that. Global X, it's a pretty big achievement to have it keep on going, and you know, obviously, people, a lot of people utilize and love that as their way to access gold. So it looked great to see that you know we need it to have another twenty years, obviously. So it'll be it'll keep on going. I've got no doubt that it will have another 20 years in it. And from memory to Heath, we recorded a podcast the next morning after yes, we did. I'd been at that event as well. And I think that people are still asking me if I'm okay. You're a bit um, shady. <laughs> I'm made of stronger stuff. I had to teach a few kids a lesson, as I remember. So, that's, uh, yeah, that they uh, I think they're still recovering from that as well. But I'm, I'm like an RSL carpet. You just run a vacuum cleaner over it the next morning and I'm good to go. This the, the cigarette smoke and the scotch and the beer and everything just gets uh, just gets sucked right out of it and it's all good to go. Um the yeah. Now artificial intelligence player. The, I wanted to go a little bit further into it, into into the depth of it as opposed to it just being oh yeah, AI is here. You've got your chat GPT. This is what it can do. Oh great, isn't it good that it's writing my statements for me? Is it great that's writing my emails for me and stuff like that. There's, and then I've also got my my potentially overly simplistic view, which is that uh, artificial intelligence is great for data centers. That's 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 where that is, and obviously I've got a bit more behind that thesis, but it doesn't matter so much. But you've put together this really sort of good few points on the different areas of AI, and I was hoping to make this more of an educational session, just to go through the the the, the, the various sectors of it, and we can maybe sort of break down where the winners and losers are at the end of it and maybe where some of the, the advantages are that aren't. Um, Heath, I know that you've got that in front of you as well. Yep. Um, Blair, mate, the floor is yours to start off with and we'll just pe- pepper away at you as you go along. Yeah, okay. Well, how about we just do this as a, as a test? Do you, do either of you two know what GPT actually stands for? I do now, no. yes. I, do. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I've, I've, I've always known what the first word stands for, but now I know what the next two are. Yeah, and the, the third one is probably important. In transformer, but I, I think the context of this is, and let me let me be really clear up front. I'm not an AI expert. I don't work in AI. I'm, I work in investments. Mm-hmm. So the context of all this is going to be on the investment side, and I work in an ETF business that has a focus on thematics. So if you're putting two and two together, the concept here is that you can play a theme, and this theme, whether it's broader technology or specific technology, in the case of AI, through ETFs. Um, you know, hopefully on the ASX uh, or globally, however, however you best get access to it. So, again, I'm not a, I'm not at any level close enough to to AI to think that I would ever be be able to be under the proper under the curtain and understand how these guys run these. Like it is extremely complex, and you know, obviously, some of the smartest people in the world. But I, look, I think I think you, to understand AI, it really you have to you have to understand the waves of AI because AI in the current tense. And what's happening right now? And if, sorry, if you, sorry. There, hopefully that wasn't a death. Um, <laughs> it's my little, my little lucky coin that I keep in my head. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the current, the current chance of what we are right now is is this sort of revolution of of generative AI. So the generation of text or or um, images or to a certain degree um, video. So it's you know it's very early days in that in that in that sense. But look, AI has certainly been around for a lot longer. Than that, you can go back as far as the 50s. Obviously, the Turing test is that one big test of, you know, is it a computer? Is it a is it a is it a human? That pretty much has been at this this point in time being done. It's very difficult if you if you're blind if you do a blind test to know that. Uh, and then I think the other part of it is that there was this whole period of time, sort of circa 30ish years of uh, the AI winter. So this whole period of time where 
there wasn't huge advancements or huge moves in AI in that there was no, you know, it probably lacked some big, credible sort of the right word, but, you know, applications that were doing and moving anything or innovating in that sense. And then we kind of got, and you remember this, things like Deep Blue, um, uh, that was certainly one of those ones that, that came along and, and did some work around from the chest with Deep Blue. That was a big deal. And then if you go back a few years uh, after that, that you've got... Yeah, D- Deep Blue was the first computer. There was an IBM computer, right? That was the first. Yeah, it's an IBM. Be, it's first computer to be the human at chess, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. So yeah. that, that was that was a long time ago. And then they and then Google did one actually more recently where they um was um uh, I think it's uh, the South Korean game. Is it called Go? I'm not sure. I can't remember what it's called, but uh, where it's infinitely more complex than chess in terms of the amount of moves you could it make. Is, they, it but, is Go. Yes, is yeah. Is what it is. My father so taught me how to play. It was very difficult to do. Yeah, so I'd say yep. you'd be beating my computer there so, yourself. So, <laughs> so there's those ones. And then you've got things like, again, in IBM, like Watson, again, who's taking like, um, uh, they, I think they were on Jeopardy, but they, I've used Watson a little bit. It's an interesting concept of how they can take this and then you can extrapolate it to that. And it's sort of, it's certainly a little bit more predictive. And then like things like Siri and, and Hey Google and that sort of stuff. So there's, it's sort of been around and it's it's been in ebbs and flows. I think that's the context. It's been in ebbs and flows around around the hype around it because we can talk about the hype and there's a really good um there's a really good concept around hype from gartner which is actually just a consulting firm but around the hype cycle and what where the stages are and, and i think ai has been on this hype cycle a fair bit because it's been up and down in terms of that of that uh hype cycle but obviously we're in a situation now where generative ai which has kind of been around for nearly 10 years in its own right but certainly took off when the application of, you know, certainly ChatGPT came along and sort of blew a lot of people's minds around what what the capacity and capabilities are. So you you when that sort of launched, uh, that's I think was a a bit of a gate opener for a lot of people to think this is now more mainstream and the application is broader than it is just on minute technology. So I think I think look that's that's where I just want to start. Like to start to say this isn't new. It's not, it's not six months old. Uh, it has been around for a long time. The technology has changed significantly, as does all technology, but it's iterative. All this type of technology is iterative. It's iterating on existing technology to get better and get better. So we're up to chat, chat GP, sorry, up to GPT 4.0, you know, and it was significant, which is significantly better than GPT 3.5. Yeah. So you've got this situation where it's, it's iterating, but substantially getting better each time. So uh, okay, so let's just go into the first little uh, first little hitting that you've got here. Yeah, and and yes, obviously it does. And the fact that it gets to learn off itself, and that the tools that are there to then make sort of make itself is also so then whether it it goes exponential. So let's talk about the numbers here of how I've got to zoom in on this one just to see. It was just how quickly the time to scale to a million users um for the big platforms and this is something that i think a lot of people talk about a little while ago but reiterate exactly how long it goes so it took netflix what three and a half years to get a million yeah, so users netflix three and a half years um and we know chat gpt i think instagram is two and a half months chat gpt was around five days and that, that's and i think i actually saw another stat i was actually um listening to a podcast the other day a, a bloomberg podcast on etfs this is what we do in etfs we're just listening to things about etfs yeah I think it mentioned it was 100 million in two months, something like that, which is, again, the fastest um, technology of essentially of all time. But, you know, it's not, it's not, it hasn't been really monetized yet. So it's a bit of a different concept. But, you know, the rest of those, the the rest of those companies in that list, Netflix is one of them, but Instagram, Spotify, you know, Facebook, these sorts of things. So it is certainly the, when when that door opened, it really did change the game. And I think it changed the game because, you know, we've got to always put this back into the context of investors' minds. It changed the game in investors' minds around the capacity to generate wealth or, or you know, money out of this space. And most people have gravitated back to, and I think you mentioned earlier, NVIDIA um, as one because it's you know, certainly recently had some really, really strong numbers. But, you know, it is this is when we think about, again, that those waves around where we're up to. Um, this is the new wave and, and there's a lot of talk around this is a this type of technology is going to really change the game significantly because it's going to continually get better. You, you said learn off yourself, but learn off uh, better data sets um, much faster. 
much more efficient and then be able to deliver much more efficient and much more relevant information. So they're the two things that all matter really yep. when it comes to this stuff. So let's go into the, uh, as so we've got different segments of the AI sort of areas of where we can see advantages and disadvantages. So the first one, also one of the ones that you've got here is as a service. So AI as a service. So what have we got that's under uh, underneath that bracket? We'll see if we can come up with a few ideas for this one. So I think this is the concept. So, so again, the concept stage is AI. So open AI was, uh, you know, generated as a not-for-profit, um, some, some um, beneficiary and some donors sort of put some money into that to start it out. We know now that they've, make, they've made money out of it through Microsoft. Um, with, they've had a deal with that. So so when you think about that, so that's great. They probably haven't made, outside of that, made, made huge amounts of monetization. But this is the concept, again, the investability of this is what are the business models that are going to work for this type of technology? And it comes down to... It, you know, for those investors out there who, who look at SaaS style um, software as a service style platforms, this is where AI can play a huge role in that space because you're essentially going to be able to license a version of that GPT model and plug it in to whatever style software you want to work. Now, for those of you who have used um, Microsoft Search Engine Bing and then there's the chat function there sort of built into the their browser now, yeah, that for them is a... is they're not going to make money out of that. That's not where they make money out of. What they make money out of that is, is you go on to use their browser and their search engine, and they obviously sell ads through that program and try to chip away at Google's um, massive share in that space. So it's a bit of a it's a bit of a throughput for that. That's how you think about it as a as a software as a service. Um, and I think we've we've got some estimates from a bunch of different research um, houses out there to, to get an understanding of where where we think this could go and you know the, the expectation is um from one particular research house which is called grandview research that uh, we work with that ai as a service could get to and this is in us dollars just under a sort of 100 bill uh in sort of you know end of the decade so th that's basically going from at the moment very very small amounts of money to very significant amounts of money pretty quickly Okay, then okay, what are the next ones? Sorry, Heath, mate, do you want to chip in on this one? Oh, no, you're going beautifully. It's excellent. I'm, I'm doing, I'm I'm doing soak, all the lifting here. Soaking it only. <laughs> well, someone's going to do it. Okay, that's all right. Um, okay, so then what's what, – uh, just keep going, Heath. Uh, so, yeah, so, uh, again, we're just thinking about implementation of – implementation of technologies into either an existing product – Again, so, you know, could you, so software as a service, does it, does it want to be independent? And if you think about software as a service, you can think about Salesforce as an example, as one of those where you'd buy the service, it's just a software package, it doesn't have any physical product, and you pay a subscription fee. And that's that's kind of, I think, where it's going to move. That's probably the, the expectation. It becomes in two areas that are going to be focused. Obviously, there's direct-to-consumer. And we're seeing a version of that with ChatGPT, but mostly where the money will be made, I suspect, is in enterprise software. So there's a couple of things that are obviously already happening. Uh, we just mentioned Bing with Microsoft, and as we talked about OpenAI with Microsoft and the, and the deal, that they have already they've already talked about. They've got some prototyping out there now that that uh, that there will be a co-pilot in Office 365. So across all their so Outlook in Teams in. Are you telling me? Clippy's coming back Clippy's as AI. Was <laughs> that, that, that was, the, that was back. the rumor. That was the rumor. Um, I don't think Clippy's coming back. Uh, that was the, that was the meme at the time when they when they um, bought this out probably a couple of months ago. Um, I think it hopefully is better than Clippy. Uh, but yeah, Clippy, hey, Clippy could be in the list of AI we talked about earlier. Uh, yeah, just a very 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 annoying version. It, and, for, it, and for anyone who's look, I'm forty, nearly forty one years old. Probably anyone who's under the age of thirty probably doesn't know who Clippy is, but. Uh, Go back and have a look it up. No, the kids, the kids, a listen to this show, and b they get the they get the old memes. They know okay. they know the things. Anyway, look, it could be anyone who was out there. There was a time when Microsoft Word was out that that there was Clippy that was just this helpful little pop up helpful. thing. Air quotes <laughs> on a podcast don't work. Helpful little uh, attempted helpful little pop up thing. Now in in with Microsoft, anything that is attempted to be helpful is the worst freaking idea. In the world, and I'm talking about this. Okay, let's take an example. Um, we've got Microsoft, as everyone does, and if it wasn't for the fact that everyone had this Microsoft thing, no one would use the damn thing in in any way. I've, I get my little Teams email every morning. I don't know. I can't remember what it's called. But it's, it's a little thing that's just like, "Hey, here's your lineup for the day," um, and it's it, it is it is very artificially intelligent with what it's got. 
we think we're predicting that you need to do this. Maybe if you see, hit this button and change this and everything's going to, we'll change your schedule and schedule this and, and make this call. And it's actually fairly predictive, which is really handy for Microsoft. However, it's that next stage. And there's this little thing that was in there. It was very funny that at the bottom, it's like, we recommend also, hey, get yourself a bit of um, bit of headspace. How about some meditation? And I'm into the meditation thing. Um, click this button for for to, to to go through your headspace meditation for your morning and 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 start the day right. And I'm I'm on my phone. I just go, you know what? Okay, click the button, and it immediately goes to the Microsoft um, the login box. I'm just like, if you if you want me to go to a meditative state and try and relax my mind. Just take me there. I don't need to go and log into Microsoft to to be able to go to this stage. What's stopping a great company like Microsoft having something so incredible that is going to change so many lives and change the world? What's stopping Microsoft from just tripping over their own damn stupidity on this stuff? Well, I think it, they, they definitely have in the past. But you, when you think about Microsoft, and for those of you out there to the point on Teams and, and look, there's been a couple of lawsuits on things like Teams from uh, accusing from acquisitions around people, other other businesses like Slack, which is actually owned by Salesforce now. On the fact that the bundling process of of certainly Office 365 is so powerful um, that they they essentially run a program where if they bundle Teams in, Teams takes over, they can raise the price. And there's nothing you can do about it because yep. it is just it built in, and this is this is what something like this is, so if they if they can get you working, and Excel is a great example, if they can get you working in Excel uh, and it is co-piloted by GPT and is then predictive and then instead of you typing in, uh, I need to, you know, whatever it is, like you need you think about these people who are good at Excel and I'm not one of them necessarily, <laughs> um, but you know, our portfolio managers are unbelievable who are writing code, like basically writing code or, or, or formulas that are, you know, as long as the page. If you could do that by by current language, Think about the the ability to open up to more people, and then the lock in. Like the lock in for that would be, if you, if Google didn't have that with their version, or I know Apple's got a version, it's not very good, but you just you can never leave. It's impossible to leave. So they're just trying to they're just trying to again think about ways to lock in. The other example of this is, and for those of you who are in, in finance, um, Bloomberg are also integrating. GPT into their terminal. Their terminal is very, very expensive. It's way more expensive than, than Office. It's sort of twenty five thousand US a year. But they've, you know, it is again, it is integral to the global financial system. If you if you don't have access to Bloomberg, you are at a disadvantage, and this is only going to make it worse. So if you're in a situation where I can be serviced, and then and in your uh, competitor, like a competitor might be Faxet, for example, and they don't have that, there's it's just again impossible to move from that so you've just got this situation where these existing companies will will tack it on tack on these uh, ai components and they will incredibly um, increase that lock-in so if you think about the revenue that is possible that they can add on a top you know because you're locked in you're adding on more revenue on top you want access to this this is the most powerful thing everyone else is doing it you're not doing it you're at disadvantage as a business now you have to pay more and more for this stuff. So it's it just seems inevitable in that space. And that's where, that's where whether how we looked at, if you look at the revenue and the balance sheet of these companies, it won't say, hey, AI, we make this much money, but it will play a large role in keeping that money really sticky and yeah. increasing the increasing the spend. So I think, um, oh, sorry. Was, I th- no, you I go. Think, I think uh, Satya from uh, C- um, Microsoft said Microsoft. Microsoft. Yeah, a couple of months ago, he said every application and online service will become an AI application or service eventually. That's how integrated AI will become. Yeah, I could see that. I could see that happening. I, and definitely based on what you're saying, favours the incumbent. I mean, what you're saying, mm. as much as I hate it, Microsoft is 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 going to get bigger and more uh, not pervasive. The, the the more more tentacles and much stickier suction pads. Yeah, yeah, and they are they are the best at enterprise software. Let's put it that way. No, they're yeah. the biggest. The, the, and and well, they'll Windows, look at Office. I mean, they have it all. Teams crossed 300 million users the other day. I have a um, theory that team, that that COVID was completely manufactured just to get people onto Teams. <laughs> no one was using – no. James is talking. Adults are talking here. The um, – the, <laughs> No, no one was talking. Had on. No, 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 do you remember – okay. Do you remember that Microsoft went for ages just go? I, I've speculated this in many a pub, okay, over the last couple of years. But 
Remember Microsoft brought Teams out and nobody touched the damn thing. And there was every time you opened up, opened up, uh, opened up your computer, the pop up came up and said, "Hey Teams, would you like to use Teams? Have you heard about Teams? You want to know about Teams? We get Teams. Teams coming on here." And a friend of mine actually moved to Microsoft, and I'm just going. You're going to help try and sell Teams. Just going. It's going to be a tough, tough slog um, that they're going to do. And and they just push Teams and Teams and Teams at you. COVID happened. Everyone used Zoom. People realized that Zoom wasn't as secure. Teams was there straight up. Integrated, here's the key thing, Integrate. I was making a point, integrated with everything that you already had anyway so that instead of Zoom being the add-on from external, you've got Teams internally on your Outlook that you could then hit a button for and it was there ready to go and then you could put it on your phone and everything was all, it was, it was all connected and then bang. And COVID, COVID was just like, and now we're all using Teams. So we went from, this is what we did during COVID. We went from Slack to Zoom because we needed to be out of video easily and Slack just didn't have that capability to, well, we're on Zoom, but Zoom doesn't do all of the other stuff that we needed to do that Teams has got us here ready to go. Teams was there ready to go. Microsoft did COVID so that Teams would be in, in usage. And I'll, I'll, I'll take that to the grove. Do we just hang up now, or just <laughs> <laughs> drop the mic? <laughs> He's walking away. That's it. You laugh now, don't you? Yeah, it's just just you wait. But it, look, it, the point that I am making is that is that the reason why everyone used Teams eventually is because it was. I mean, the the, the trigger the trigger is beside the point. That everyone used Teams because it's just like you know what we were on Slack, we were, we, we were on Zoom for video. Hang on, why don't we just use this thing that does both of these things? We can make calls internally as well, and it's already integrated with everything that we need to do with our filing systems that we've got here too. So AI is going to be the extension of that too. That that's the end of it. Okay, right. Um, oh, you mentioned Bloomberg. Tell us about the Bloomberg stuff here. It's pretty light on detail at this point, but yeah, the expectation is that they are going to put a version of GPT, a GPT, GPT style AI system. And for those of you out there who have used Bloomberg for years, it, it becomes intuitive after about the fifth year because it is not like Windows where you just, it's sort of, they think about it and they're like, you know, move from here to here and this goes here. And it's like Bloomberg is kind of made to be painful. Um, yes, yeah, yes, very clunky. Very, very clunky, clunky but, yeah. but ridiculous data and amazing. And again, you oh, are yes. a disadvantage if you don't have access to Bloomberg and you work in the financial market. So it's one of those things where if they can, if they can make their ability to, communicate better with their clients, make their clients communicate better with the system and then get access to better information, which is all in, it's in there, it's all in there, then it's going to be it's certainly going to be um, going to be beneficial. So I think that so they, they, they the software as a service idea, plugging into existing services is probably the core part of what's going to happen. I think just, you know, the, on the other side of where the winners are, and I think you mentioned both of them, um, James. So certainly GPUs. I, I don't know. We can definitely get on that that path uh, if it. you want to get in there. Go for it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or, look, GPUs is GPU number one. Cloud is number one, is number two, and that's very linked to GPUs in their own right because GPUs are now they're powering that part of the cloud anyway. And then the second, the third part of that whole ecosystem is the data management of what goes into these large language models or, or essentially the models that these um, AI are learning off. Uh, and managing that, and then the, the the output of that as well. So, so they're the, probably the three biggest winners. I, I think. I think no question on the GPUs. I think this is pretty well documented. We don't need to spend a lot of time here. Yeah. But if you look at you look at where, if you take out if you took out uh, crypto mining, which obviously the, the graphical processors unit, and we won't spend the detail on the difference between a GPU and a CPU, Intel focused their life on that CPU x86 architecture. That was their world. It still is their world. It's not. It's not necessarily terrible for AI, but it's but it's nowhere near as efficient as a GPU, which is graphical processing unit, which de- did very well for uh, for video games. That's where it's obviously the sweet spot. That's what they started out at. Then it did very well uh, for crypto mining as well. They kind of stamped that out and that sort of slowed off. And then, then it's now done very well for AI. They kind of they have somewhat. And Nvidia has pivoted very well, but they somewhat fell into those last two. But they pivoted really well, and they pivoted really well because they are at the forefront of the hardware. But the smart part about what Nvidia did, they're at the forefront of the software. So they essentially had the best AI-driven software globally, and it's very hard to walk away from that if you pair it with what you get out of that out of that GPU. 
So for what most of these people are doing, I'm going to talk about the, this AI. You know, they're, they're essentially renting renting time and space in a uh, in a hyperscale, so a data center essentially, um, to access these GPUs that Nvidia is plugging in through the software that, that Nvidia has. So that they, they they've got this captive market, this captive market, and then then because they're learning all this, this is the clever part. They're learning all this. They are then iterating on their existing uh, GPUs, which maybe weren't perfectly built for AI, but you know they, they had a big component of that and they sort of done a little bit on that to, to build pure AI style GPUs, which are going to just take the, you know, they're going to drive efficiency massively. Uh, so they, they've they've captivated. So that's why, the you know, it went up 20% in aftermarket one day on the back of their report, because they've just, they've essentially figured it out and they've captured the market. There's no other way to go. I do. I, I love the way, and Heath, I know that you're going to go, but I, just to be the other guy in the room on NVIDIA, because you should always have another guy in the room on everything that happens, is, and whilst, yes, we, we own things that are long, NVIDIA and annoyingly used to own the actual stock itself, um, didn't sell at the lows like Kathy Wood, who actually predicted this coming and has managed to miss most of it. Um, it's so funny. Lawrence McDonald here, whose his Twitter handle is ConvertBond, just, just talking the other day, you know, quote, we don't have a fab, so, you know, a fabrication plant totally dependent on geopolitical tranquility in the South China Sea, 37 times sales. He's being facetious on that. Yeah, so 37 times sales. For some reason, that, that they managed to find themselves being good at gaming. They're always the best, best in gaming chips, and then they were the best in crypto chips, and then during COVID, they were the best in metaverse chips, and now they're the best in AI chips. Isn't it a weird coincidence that they just always somehow coincidentally have the absolute best world beating chips in whatever new thing there is that comes out oh, it's, it, you know what it's it is and it isn't um there's a really good book for any uh, for those readers out there it's uh it came out last year it's a book called chip war and yeah, it talks about that one yep. yeah so it's it, hate you done to say this so excellent book around mm. just how you know when we talk about thematics uh at global x we talk about that they are long-term themes they're long-term sort of you know paradigm shifts around what's happening and the demographically, technologically. Semiconductors has been around since the 60s. This is not new. It's iterating since the time, you know, for many, many years ago. And, and to talk about, yeah, the fabrication, they don't own, most, most don't own fabrication because it is too complex it's, and it's too expensive to, to do that. And this, and this book sort of articulates why that's had to happen, how it happened over time. And then a little bit on that um, Taiwan basically running 70% of the global yeah. um, semiconductor production and and the impact of that politically so oh, yeah. catch so, up to taiwan is impossible it's 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 an infinite number of money uh, amount of money and the time that it takes you to do it something the next thing's already happened anyway um yeah 100 yeah, yeah. essentially essentially impossible especially if you're, well, you're talking about the nanometers that are up to now which is is like it's um, like it's unbelievable right it's the, the level that they're going to now is just um so significant so i think gpu wise uh, yes it's very nvidia is expensive before they went up twenty percent, um, so you're talking about talking about the PE. So PE is a really easy way to sort of look at it and go. The PE was expensive; it looked expensive on paper before the P went up a lot on the back of that uh, report. And the earnings hasn't come yet, but the expectation is the earnings comes at the back end, and then that sort of sort of stabilizes. I think I had a look on Bloomberg yesterday. The PE, this is what Bloomberg Bloomberg data. PE of Nvidia is 186 times at the moment. But they forecast it next year at fifty. So the earnings is catching up to the price. Yeah, the that, that current, current earnings are one hundred eighty six times um, trailing, but yeah, next year is fifty. Yeah, yeah, that's, so that's, that's a massive good. lift in earnings. Mm. Massive lift in earnings. So, so no again, doubt, no doubt, no doubt, no doubt, no doubt. Yeah. Uh, so, so when you read all that, even in the middle of last year when this wasn't the big deal, Nvidia was essentially not losing money, but going going somewhat backwards on on video, uh, sorry, on video game chips, and then making a lot of money into into uh, into data centers. So this is the point around: are they they always sort of, you know, they're, they're the head of the game? They probably are because this is where it's worked for them. They open that capacity up. So there's certainly that space, and then the second space on that kind of links to that data centers is the cloud, because again, the access through this is through the cloud. So. Like even so, AWS, which is Amazon, Azure, which is Microsoft, and then Google's cloud, they all have their own sort of GPU platforms, which have a like GP, Google's got a version of AI technology that they can use. People can uh, rent and hire. So that's also a massive spend space that's going to happen 
um, because once it's always built and, and plugged in, you can obviously house it in the cloud. So there's certainly that's huge expectations around that. And then to just finish this up, because I know we're probably going a little bit long, but um, is data management. So companies like, and this is in the FANGs now, if you think about the FANGs being 10 stocks, not just the FA, FAA, NMG, I can't, can't keep up with the Close name enough. changes. Yep. Yeah, things like Snowflake is one of them. It's in the FANG, but another one, like another one called Datadog, which is again, it's, it's data metrics. And I think the expectation around data analytics, data management, data metrics is that, and I think this is from Fortune, that this market will be sort of 650 billion by to a year, a year, revenue by 2029. So huge, like, because because the data is going so big and this these AI only increase data, and then you add on to that, this is a different part, things like Internet of Things, which will be connected to AI. So this is where robotics comes in. Like it just it explodes, it explodes. So if you don't know how to manage that, then you're you just get lost in it. So yeah. there's a, they're probably the three areas I think that really stack up for expectations around the, the benefits in this space. Yeah, that, that that works. And if we're going to go into it any deeper, then I suppose that we'd have to be sitting here for hours. hours that's, sort of not, yeah. that's not the model of the new show. So I'm just, I, I am sorry about that. And, um, and I think that we have gone a little bit over. Um, Blair, mate, thanks very much for helping us out with that. Now stick around. Uh, also, so uh, look, the ETF that I would prefer, Heath. Which the one? ETF that oh, you would on prefer? the ASX, sorry. Preferably one, preferably one by Global X because we have a guest I, here. I think, I think Fang. You have to go with Fang. Yeah. Because um, basically everything in it is AI. Yeah. Um, or AI related. Well, um, yeah. Because well, I, I mean, there's no point looking at revenue generated by AI at the moment because it's nothing. Yeah. But what the potential is, I mean, you got Microsoft, Google, Meta, you know, Snowflake, and all that, all that in there. Um, so I, I think you'd have to look at Fang to start with. Yep. Yep. Easy yep. enough for me. Um, but, 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 but what's the next one? Okay. Now, RBA. What the hell? Yeah. Twenty percent chance of a of a rate hike, and they, uh, they do it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look. I, the last two, I I can't, can't get my head around. I think they needed a pause. Let to the consumer, you know, soak it in, in soak it all in. Let yep. you know the other rate hikes flow through to the economy. Um, but because we did that pause and, you know, everyone thought, okay, this is it. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've defended low in the RBA a little bit. I mean, a lot of people say, you know, no rates till 2024 and that. I'm like, that's not exactly what he said. But anyway, move on. You didn't. But now I'm like, okay, I can't get my head around it. I look, but if you look back historically, after we've had a pause, there's traditionally been two rate hikes after a pause and then the cycle has ended. So maybe we're there now. I don't know. I, th I think uh, in all the economic data we're seeing in Australia now, it's coming in really, really soft. Um, and just at a, a, a uh, sorry, at a company level, you know, companies like uh, Baby Bunting, uh, Universal Group, Adairs, uh, Best and Less, they all will come through. This is in the consumer discretionary, all coming through, downgrading earnings for this year. Yeah. Um, and, and next year is not looking much better. You can see the consumer starting to hurt. And, they're going to go too far, I think, and going to push us into a recession we don't really need here in Australia. That that is almost my take, almost to it. And I'm just coming up with something now, which I've bounced off some of the guys that I that I chat with. That you know, the the guys that write these economic pieces and everything. And I'll just sort of bounce something off. And, and and I think that one of my strengths in investing is has always been trying to gauge public sentiment about where things are moving. I did it very well during COVID, um, and I've done it. Uh, I've I've done it quite well, sort of going on with, with the things I'm doing. I knew that inflation was going to be sticky. I knew that uh I knew that what was the other thing that I knew? I knew that I knew that the workplace was going to change as well after this. A lot of people were saying people will go back to work, it's going to be okay. And I was just like, no, they will refuse to go back to work. Um and things are going to change because of that. And then we're going to see something different that that that, that comes and wages are going to be a big issue um on this and working conditions are going to be big all of these things I've sort of been able to invest around and do quite well. Right now the sentiment for me is sort of smelling like it's it's a lot of the work that the RBA is, was going to have to do for the next couple of months has been done already and is going to be done for the next couple of weeks. So it's sort of like the, they're doing their own jaw burning or that mm -hmm. th this is the jaw burning that's, that, that's happened. And now people have, it's hit home. This has been yep. the week where it's hit home and just gone, I need to stop now. And uh, we kids, this is the week when we don't do pizza. Kids, this is the week when I'm going to pull you out of these classes now. We are now we are now running our own recession. I don't need to to, to see it in front of me. Yes, you and you go out into the cities, the main uh, eating districts, and that, and restaurants are that still reasonably full. Um, so people are still 
eating out. They might not be buying their computers or TVs and that anymore, but they are still spending it on experiences. Yeah. But I think uh, we're going to see that fall off a cliff over the next few months. I okay. think people are going to say, right, the RBA is not stopping or they're afraid they're not going to stop. We need to prepare for something, you know, much worse in the future. Can you keep on talking? I've just had a client order hit and I just need you to sort of carry this conversation. <laughs> got, it's, it's 14 minutes to four and and, 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 he's, and he's just said, hey, I, I, I just need to do this. So I just need to get that done. The, the joys of retail of retail uh, advice here is sort of one of those things. Beautiful, I beautiful. Um, well, I, mate, I can come in. You, you can go you've saved my ass on many an occasion, Blair. I'm going to expect you to do it again, please. Thank you so much. Yeah, no. Hang on. I'm okay, get this I, I thankfully don't trade anymore. Um, oh, look, I, think, I think you're probably right. I think the, the concept in the RBA statement that, that, that they are going to well, look at or continue to raise rates in the future is, is probably more so, they, if they pulled it out, that sentence out of the, uh, out of the statement, yep. people would think that, that we've hit the terminal rate and we're done. And that's, they just cannot let that happen. No. Uh, but you walk down, I'm in Sydney, right? So you walk down Pitt Street, I, I don't know if this is every year, so don't, don't, maybe it is at this time of year, but everyone's on sale. Yep. And I've got, you know, my wife's in retail, Retail isn't flying off the shelf right now. They are no. certainly struggling. So it's hitting, it's hitting that style to your point around the TVs. This is more in, uh, in, um, in apparel, but it's certainly hitting that, that area. You know, yeah. I think that the, 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 the restaurants and everything might be the last to go because people, there's still a bit of hangover from COVID of people just hating having to sit inside their house and deal with that. So yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's and, just a bit of hangover. Yeah. But, yeah, but it's, it, it's the rent thing too. So I know that's you know part of the CPI basket. We talk a lot about the CPI basket here because we, we've got a lot of commodity ETFs. So we're saying you know as a way to inflation hedge, commodities are great because they're a big part of the basket. But okay, I'm back. What did I miss? Only good things. Good. Uh, yeah, you, you're it, out. You're out now, James and Blair, yeah. for the uh, the remainder of the season. Oh, good. <laughs> that's a relief. But yeah. So I just I, to go back to the point. I, I just think that you know it's very possible that they are that they're done, but. They're never going to say they're done. No. And they're happy to let us, even investment professionals or people, like, you know, the economist, I'm not an economist, but the economists, just not be not sure. And yeah. they're, they're happy with that. I think they're going to have to walk back at least one rate hike, maybe two in the fourth quarter this year. I think data is softening faster than I expected. I thought we would, the consumer was a little bit more resilient than it was. But uh, some of this data coming through now here in Australia especially the job starter is a little bit softer than I expected. With all this net immigration, I thought that would hold jobs uh, figures up a, l a lot better than it has, but um, it hasn't. And uh, we're going to see one month where maybe we get twenty or 30,000 jobs lost soon. And I think that will really hit home as well. I've, I've, got, I've, I've got a sneaky feeling that the things that can drop will drop and they'll drop really quickly starting this week. This that's week. that's that's me doing. I'm just going to concoct this over the weekend and just go. Does it make sense to do a bit of work while I'm out there looking at people skip? But that's 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 where I'm just going to go. Anything that can drop will drop. So retail retail, retail only gets a little bit of splurge towards the end of the financial year because hey, you know you get these tax incentives. Right now, so, I'm going to be, right now I'm going to be like, I you know what? I'm I'm this way inclined of just going that my finger on the pulse is telling me that screw it, guys. We're just, we're just not going to be buying this stuff. I don't care about the end of financial year. And it's and it's just going to be maybe companies will maybe companies won't but it, it, the, the funny thing that'll hit home is if we look at what the June numbers are going to be or these uh, for, for the end of this quarter, I, I I think it's just going to be really really disappointingly weak and we're going to say okay this is this is it this is just sort of where it's dropped. Yeah, and I'm not talking a major recession here in Australia. Maybe if we do have a recession, a, shallow, a very shallow one. Oh yeah, but but you know the the bottom and some of middle class uh, will will really hurt. There will yeah. be some some real hurt out there and well, some jobs lost. I mean, can we talk about the tone deafness of of Phil Lowe at the moment? Like he, he he's yeah. going he's going for broke on popularity, isn't he? I mean, not that I it think, matters. I think he knows he's done in September, so he's he's just telling it how he really thinks it is. And well, it was a, a <laughs> cracking cracking comment from Nick Fabrio, uh, Longhorn Capital on Twitter, who's an amazing trader as well. Trades the tape, just an absolute gun. The and he was just like, you know what? If I was Phil Lowe, you're checking out anyway. Go for broke. Go yep. hike. Go and then be the guy that actually that actually said, you know what, inflation was stickily high, and I got it down. And you know what, I didn't I didn't completely blow up the property well yet. I haven't completely blown up the property market. And any recession that you have done was potentially going to be shallow. Remember what? Um, oh, what's her name? Uh, Emma Fisher from Early Funds. Remember she was on the show. Yep. Was it, Emma? Yeah. Australia goes. Australia doesn't go boom bust. Australia goes it boom. Mums. Okay. 
right? Yep. Those are, that, that's that's the fact that she's 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 better at this than I am. So, yep, that's I, I'll go with that as well. And that's it. It's like you know what? Hey, Phil, do it. But however, don't go out to the Morgan Stanley lunch or breakfast the next morning and say people need to pick up more hours if they can, and 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 cut back on some things. And do, like it's just so easy just to go and pick up a few hours because yeah. I'll tell you what. If I was if I was the editor of the Daily Telegraph. I would be currently organising my guys to not maybe not tail them, but just go. Hey, here's a day in the life of your standard RBA board member. This is uh, how much they make. This is how much they spend. This is what they eat for dinner. This is what was served at the RBA the day that they decided to rate uh, to, to to hike rates on you one more time. Mm. This is this is what they are owing on their properties, and this is how many properties they actually own. They are not. This is what I'd be doing. They are not you, and I'll be making them public enemy number one, and I'll probably get a letter of complaint from the RBA saying that our people are now in danger. But that's 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 actually how closely these guys are moving to it. That actually, you know, you could easily stir up some public opinion to say, if you see Phil Lowe in, in the shops, throw a banana at him. And, I, and I'm really – I've got a really bugbear with them relying on heavily lagging um, inflation data when other data around them – Macro data is suggesting otherwise. Yep. And they've got utilities at their fingertips. They knock on the bank's doors and say, we want live spending data um, of the consumer, you know, coming through to us, you know, once a week or once a month or whatever it is because they've got that those at their fingertips, the banks mm. do. And what better way to understand where the economy is at than, you know, looking at that sort of data? Because I know yeah. the Fed have similar sort of data at their fingertips. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, uh, what's next? Russell, 2000, uh, are we buying? Uh, I'm cautious because, I mean, I know there's a lot of hype around the gamma direction and the cool um, exposure there. But generally, the move into small caps is the end, the tail end of a uh, rally, um, and the macro position of the US economy does not stack up for um, small caps. It's actually very dangerous. It's very, it's, it's a very and, strange. And there's percent. been a big bounce in the regional banks and the regional banks make up 14% of the Russell 2000. So um, there's there's a reason there that there could have been that big bounce this week. I, I agree on the charts. It looks fantastic. But I'm very, very wary with the US small caps. I think that tra- traditionally speaking, it's actually at a relative basis, very low to the large cap index, mm. um, which so it's sort of at that same basing point where, it's actually value compared to large cap, large caps. The call of buying volume in it. So there's 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 long term and short term reasons just on these basic sort of things, not going into the fundamentals of, of the underlying. The call buying in the Russell is the highest on record. That's so we're getting we're getting this gamma squeeze thing again that we had in in tech in COVID, um, and that's apparently been a big part of the reason why this is going up and has gone up quite significantly. And I think it's probably got a bit more to go. So short termers, I, I, I'm putting that as a bit of a, a, a tip. Yep, fair uh, enough. Blair, what have you got on that one? We don't really do a lot of the small cap space. I think it's interesting because uh, what we do is the to the off top on the fang is like this large cap yeah. space, and you know the fact that that I, th- I think it's the top three could be the top four are now bigger than the whole Russell 2000. Correct. Shows where the money's gone, and it shows that the like if you're looking at it as a momentum trader. You're looking at all these, um, you know, whether it's Lipper or whoever it might be out of the US around fund flows, you know, it's predominantly going into that high end tech. You know, they're probably, you know, if you, value hasn't worked, has it? Value has been terrible. But if there is a value, it might be down that space. Uh, but you've got to be very cautious around how you allocate to that in your portfolio right now because it's still it's still got a lot of beta in it. And if there is a if there is a turn on, on equities in general through tech or what it might be, Small cap's still going to cop it, so it's just, it's a hard, it's a very hard space. It's it's quite it's a difficult space out there in general to invest right now because you're paying pretty high premiums across the board, uh, and you know the thing is you know, in these environments can can go higher, it can just can, can continue to ride. Yep, no, yeah, good enough. We no, saw that in the ASX volumes the other day uh, this week. Their report this week showing that uh, volumes were down twenty plus percent on last year, showing. Which means obviously there's less volatility, a lot more people sitting on their hands, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that sort of points towards how how difficult the environment is as well. Hmm. Uh, it, it seems like a very easy market to push around at the moment, and it seems like that potentially is what they're going to do. So if you want to stay short uh, short term and nimble, there's a bit of a trade there. I do like to have at least one one percent in front of you. I think that the Russell is 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 a go right now. Charge in, go nuts. Uh, all general advice, uh, all can, our responsibility as usual. Uh, footy. 
Uh, I Heath, you got a win last week. Congratulations. I think I just missed out um, by uh, some other nonsense that I had happen. Usual traditional thing. It's someone else's fault. Uh, who have you got this week? Uh, my specials last game of the round. Bees to beat uh, the Pies on the King's birthday, paying a $2.10. Uh, to beat the Pies. Yeah, yeah. I, know Mel- I know Melbourne have um, Clayton Oliver out, but uh, the Pies have got uh, Dugowie is out. He's off to Bali again, apparently. Good on him. Um, <laughs> so I think I think the Dees uh, caused a little bit of an upset there. It's it's real close in the Bees. So. Uh, Blair, what do you got? Oh, I've got a quick – I'm a Swan team. We didn't play very well last night. Um, Thanks. That was quite yeah, appalling. Was yeah. Um, but my, my one would be Ken – Carlton turn around the dismal. They've won one game since April, and you shouldn't really count West Coast because they're not really an AFL team right now. Uh, but I think Carlton may be able to to win. Like they've, they've just got to come out from the scraps and be able to beat the Bombers this week. Um, and because otherwise, it's uh, it's already imploding at a very very rapid rate. If the whole the whole of um, the suburb of Carlton's going to completely explode if they if they lose again this week, I don't mind that one. Good enough. All right, in the NRL, I'm going a bit of an outsider. I think that bottom table Dragons head-to-head are going to beat the Bunnies this week. Bunnies got a lot of people out. Dragons got a bit to play for, and it's it's loose. It's it's a loose one, but, you know, I need to throw some dice at the back of the at the back of the back table to try and... What's that pan? What's that one pan? It's about 250 or something like that. Oh, yeah, it should be higher. Well, but anyway. sh- what, shorter than I thought? No, it was, it was, I think it was about 225 or something was in there, but it was, uh, I think, three and a half point start. So that sort of gives you an idea. That I, I'm invested in a company called Global Odds, and anyone who wants to invest in Global Odds, please let me know, and I will be able to put you in touch with the CEO. He's got one of those brains, or these guys have got these brains, that are just like, if you say... Uh, the charges are uh, uh, five and a half start on this one. He knows the exact odds that it will be in every single different direction. You know, these guys are just charged in this way. Um, that's those guys. Uh, look, I'm serious about the global odds thing too. If anyone wants a, an, an off-market investment in a company that runs a, a gambling platform through Southeast Asia, these guys are great. Uh, look, that's it for the show. Last bids from the guys, please. I've, I've got nothing. Enjoy your long weekend, guys. <laughs> Uh, Blair, thank you for joining us, mate, today. Oh, great to be here. Um, hopefully, like, you yeah, listeners learn something. You guys learn something. I've, I learned something. So, <laughs> okay, yeah, I Good sure combo. did. I sure did. Thanks very much. I look forward to having you back on the show again, Blair Hannon. Uh, this show brought to you by Australian Mutual Funds Exchange. Go and check out amfex.com, especially some of the cool stuff on India. I am planning to have an Indian show uh, very soon. So, thanks very much, everyone, for that. Uh, make sure that you mark well this weekend and uh, and uh, God save the king. Thanks, everyone. All right, see you, mate.